the experience of finding the existence of any sort of God the least bit intellectually compelling at all. Um, in other words, I can't, I can't, you know, lots of atheists became atheists because they did find God compelling intellectually or emotionally. And so when they sort of tore that down, they can tell you a story of, well, you know, I used to find this reason for God very compelling, but now I've got a good counter argument against it. I can't do that for you. I never, never took the least interest in 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 um, any. You know, I mean. So, so what for me is the number one argument why no God exists? It's, it would be an anthropological one, ultimately, uh, not not scientific or logical. Although, you know, I'm skilled at those things for people who need them. Um, I'm a, I'm I I can study humanity. I don't have a God to study, but I have humanity to study. And it's quite obvious that humanity has been in the business of, uh, of constructing religion for itself, not for a supernatural being. Um, just looking at how thoroughly human religion is, how religion so thoroughly reflects our foibles and uh, weaknesses as well as our strengths. It's, it's certainly got human fingerprints all over it where I can't find God's fingerprints uh, at all. So, so <laughs> if you really understand uh, religion as so thoroughly human, which it is, if we're honest, um, then, then there's not the slightest temptation to think that any God whatsoever has ever been involved in human affairs or, or been responsible at all for, for the existence of, uh, of religion. Well, there you go, John. That's, uh, that's actually quite interesting, but also, how to say, out of all your answers so far, that's probably, it's the most clear, but in terms of all your skills, in terms of analytic philosophy, probably the least impressive. But <laughs> I, I, do, I do know exactly why that is, and I do know exactly <laughs> what you mean by that. So, uh, yeah, is that, to a certain extent, why even get it off the ground in the first place, really? Just basically is that. <laughs> if we can, um, I don't know, if, do you know about the um, theologian called Richard Swinburne? Oh, sure, sure. Okay, um, so this is one, one thing, that we could go back to analytic philosophy, and you've covered sufficient reason and uh, causal explanations and the qualifications of explanations, but um, two things that you said at the, the, the top of the um, interview, one was um, natural theology, and for me personally, one of the biggest people in that field is probably someone like Alvin Plitinga, and sure. then uh, Richard Swinburne, who um, very interestingly does, well, he tries to play an analytic philosophy game but in his corner so he talks about God being the the need to postulate unseen um, entities like um, scientists do when they come up with theories but um, in terms of talking about natural theology on the one hand and so, so to a certain extent the work of Richard Swinburne as well what would you say are some of the biggest problems they encounter i'm assuming of course that sufficient reason again enters the horizon but in terms of a general overview of their paradigms in terms of explanations what do you what do you see are the biggest errors in that you could you could start with natural theology of natural theology uh of course is a species of uh what might broadly be called evidentialism mm -hmm. that is to say we're reasoning from what is observable to what is not observable now um, it's not as if theology invented that. <laughs> not at all, no. Um, uh, and it's not as if theology is the only business in town reasoning from what is observable to what is not. Um, the way is hazardous, and what you have to do is pay very close attention to your method. In other words, are you going to have a justifiable method for reasoning from the observable to the unobservable. Science, for its part, has settled on a combination of deduction, induction, and what is called abduction, reasoning to the better explanation. That is to say, if such and such a thing really existed, would we expect yes. to see uh, the sorts of things that we can observe? Abduction is necessary for scientific method. And natural theology eventually got around to using abductive methods as well. But abduction in and of itself um, is not a justifiable method for the very simple reason that, of course, abduction permits all sorts of speculation to supply 
um, ec- explanations, but that that doesn't make them um, the best explanation. For example, suppose I found several hundred dollar bills accidentally strewn about campus. I would immediately have the thought, Bill Gates must have visited. Why? Because Bill Gates is exactly the sort of extremely rich guy who could accidentally lose hundred dollar bills all over the place and never notice. Now, is my Bill Gates hypothesis a good one? Well, if true, it certainly would explain the proliferation of strewn about hundred dollar bills. But that doesn't mean that my method <laughs> is well, warranted here. Point, yes. <laughs> because there could be all sorts of other equally good hypotheses. And your method has to be able to sort out the better ones from the ridiculous ones. Unfortunately, natural theology has not paid enough attention to the justification of its method. It uses abduction, yes, and superficially, to that extent, can look scientific. But it is not properly sorted out how it will justify um, um, sorting better from worse explanations. For example, if you really are serious about explaining the distribution of good and evil in the universe, you're going to have to take seriously two other hypotheses Mm. in addition to monotheism, at the very least. One is polytheism, and the other one is uh, uh, mesotheism. Uh, Let me explain. So polytheism is sort of the idea that it was done by committee. (laughs) And and anyone who's ever served on a committee knows that that, uh, things produced by committees tend not to (laughs) work very well. But that would explain the distribution of good and evil in the universe. In other words, multiple competing gods who don't quite have their act together and get at cross purposes, and you would tend to get a mess. Um, Mesotheism is the view that there is a god, but the god is partially or entirely malevolent. That would explain the proliferation of evil in the universe as well. Natural theology um, hasn't paid enough attention to its uh, use of abduction to really be able to tell um, which hypothesis is the needed one. Mm -hmm. They just sort of go for benevolent monotheism in a sort of no-duh fashion. And that tends to keep satisfied Christians satisfied. But that doesn't mean they have a justifiable method. Um, For all we know, um, you know, it it could be uh, that the Creator really doesn't give a damn about us. Um, and natural theology can't tell the difference. Um, another problem with natural theology is that um, it uh, doesn't respect the difference between retrospective evidence and prospective evidence. So philosophers who are interested in what's called the demarcation problem mm-hmm. of science, how do you tell proper science from pseudoscience, have to deal with the demarcation problem. And 20th century philosophy of science has found one very useful ingredient to help solve the demarcation problem is the way that very good science is as much interested in appropriate future evidence to be collected as it is in past evidence that is already familiar. Natural theology is very good with retrospective evidence. In other words, anything that has already been observed to be going on Natural theology says, aha, if you believe in our God, then you can explain what we already know. Uh, Yeah, but science is as much interested in future evidence to be gathered. In other words, what would become observable by hypothesis Mm. if one theory was true over another theory? And so this is the genuine heart of the experimental method. What does natural theology predict will happen in the future in order to make its God hypothesis more plausible than the competition. Well, actually, natural theology is terrible in that respect. Natural theology isn't even as good as the as the astrologers one can read in the uh, very silly magazines at the grocery checkout line, right? At yep. least those very silly astrologers are in the business of making predictions about what will happen in the coming years. They're at least falsifiable, <laughs> even if they don't really care that they're falsified. Um, what, what prediction about what will be discovered about the universe has natural theology been in the business? The last great natural theological hypothesis 
um, in this spirit that, that it proposed was that there would be celestial spheres discovered in which planets are embedded that explain why they go around the sun. No, really, that was the last prospective piece of evidence that natural theology predicted would be discovered in order to figure out how the solar system um, kept revolving around the Earth at the center. Then right? that, then and that, that was disproven. Out. We know yeah. how that turned out, and I think natural theology learned a lesson. Don't be in the business of predicting what will be discovered about the universe into the future. Instead, theology, natural theology is always retrospective. That is to say, it is dependent on and subservient to the actual hard work of natural science and then hastily says oh we can explain that so as soon as it was discovered that um, for example the the solar system uh, came about by entirely natural causes oh god must be responsible for arranging the natural laws of gravity and so forth as soon as natural science discovered that there was a big bang Natural theology rushed in and said, oh yes, we can explain why there must have been a Big Bang. Well, this is all rather suspiciously convenient, and it just simply exposes how natural theology doesn't actually have a justifiable method of learning anything about the universe. And obviously, as you say, you highlight obviously the deficiency it suffers from in terms of predicting perspective evidence that we could test so uh, to that extent if you compare to something like the standard model of particle physics that for many a decade postulated the Higgs boson that we finally found last mm -hmm. year compared 